My name is Holly Baker and I'm interviewing Arthur Evans about his life in Oviedo. The date is April 18th, 2015 and the location is Lawton House in Oviedo. Mr. Evans, when did the Evans family come to Oviedo? My dad came <clears throat> uh, after the Second World War. But my mom's family was the one that was here early. And actually her sister, uh, Lillian Lawton, lived in this house. And um, part of her family, I think the Lawtons came in about 1867, 1868. So my mom's family came early on and then her maternal maternal no paternal grandfather came in the early 1870s i believe how are you and your family related to the founding families of Oviedo? well we didn't think of it in those terms but i think that we probably are one of the founding families and um i'll back up a minute that my mom my mother <coughs> went off to uh, high school in North Florida and then she went to college in Tennessee and then she went to Asbury in Kentucky and she had a professor an English professor at Asbury in Wilmore that um, had gone to Northwestern in Evanston and so uh, she was very interested in that and so she went to graduate school in English in Northwestern and that's how she met my dad because he and he was a Yankee and so it was highly unlikely that she would uh, marry someone from up north but she met him at Evanston in Evanston and then they lived in Evanston before the Second World War during the war uh, my dad went to France overseas and my mom came home uh, to live with her parents at the uh, Wheeler Evans home just down the street and uh, then after the war uh, my grandfather asked my dad to come and work with him at Nelson Company and that's how he came south and then what well, my oldest brother was born in Evanston and the three younger brothers uh, were born here in Orlando. Where were, when were you born? Uh, February 18, 1947. Okay. And what was Oviedo like when you were growing up? It was a very small uh, rural community. There were about 1,900 people. Uh, Seminole County was a very small county, population-wise and land mass-wise. But it's hard to think that at 1,900 people, uh, Oviedo was the second largest city in Seminole County in the 50s, uh, the 40s and the 50s. And it's only when I-4 came in that uh, Altamont and that area grew more than Oviedo. Sanford was always the largest town but we, it's hard to believe that at 1900 people, we were the second largest city in the county. But uh, it was a mostly uh, agricultural county. Um, everything revolved around the uh, citrus, celery, farming. There were flowers grown here too. We didn't grow them, but there were grown here also. And Initially, everything was, well, back in the day, things were taken out by um, steamboat. The produce was taken out by steamboat. But in about 1886, when our packing house was built, then uh, everything was taken out by rail. And I would say then, in the 60s, then most things started being taken out by truck and not as much by rail. I was trying to think of other things in growing up. Um, you know, it was very uh, peaceful community and 
you know, very low crime, things were just pretty much wide open. And uh, so. We know that you are and have been a prominent businessman in Oviedo for many years. When you entered the business community, what was the basis of the economy in Oviedo? You sort of touched on that a moment ago. Mm -hmm. Well, I uh, went to uh, Emory in Atlanta, Emory at Oxford for two years and then went to the business school in Atlanta. And when I came back in 1969, uh, 1970, it was still pretty much an agricultural community. Uh, and we had a fertilizer plant, a packing house, citrus packing house. We had a, a celery precooler. You know, we were doing all the kinds of things that traditionally had been done in Oviedo. You could still park along the main street diagonally, you know, and there just weren't that many cars or people even then. But the area, uh, UCF was um, one of the kickstarters of our growth, Disney and UCF, and actually uh, my grandmother's, one of her, her youngest brother, Charles Lee, had, uh, when we knew the university was coming, uh, gave or proposed to give a piece of property on the Econ, on Board 19 down here on the Econ, in Seminole County, but uh, Orange County really didn't want UCF to be in Seminole County, and so the powers to be in Orange County, even though this was a, a free, he was going to give it to them for free, they got together and bought, I think it was um, $300 an acre, if I remember correctly, but I believe the family gave half and they bought half, and so that's the reason UCF is just across the line in Orange County mm -hmm. and not in Seminole County, but if they had taken the free land, UCF would have been in Seminole County. And um, then the other thing, that was the beginning of a generator because professors from UCF then started coming and wanting to live in Oviedo. Before that, there was really not much, um, not a much place for people to live. And if you had, like when Mr. Webb came, the banker, or a minister, or a teacher, they would have to go around the community and ask someone, "Well, will you sell? A, will you divide your grove and sell a lot out of the grove because there are no building lots?" And um, then they would do that and the person would build a lot, a house, a home on that lot. But when UCF came, a group of men in town called Avita Land Company got together and they bought Dr. Mead's property uh, north of town. And that was the first um, organized effort to have a place when people moved here for them to live. And so that was in the 60s. Um, the economy then started to grow in other than agricultural areas. And the other thing that happened was, uh, it was happening in Seminole County and Orange County too, that when the freezes of the uh, 80s came, you had the Christmas freeze in 83, you had January the 22nd, 85, that sounds like it's two years apart, but it's really only about a year apart. And then you had the final freeze, December, um, Christmas of 89. And by the time those freezes were over, the agriculture was pretty much wiped out. Now we held on and are holding on today, but basically um, everything between here and Winter Park, all the groves that were killed, 225,000 acres of citrus was killed in those freezes. We've considered ourselves to be in the middle of the uh, citrus growing area. 
but by the end of the freezes, we were on the very, very northern tier, and uh, our production in our pack, we were harvesting a million two boxes of fruit. By the end of the second freeze, we had dropped to 86,000 boxes of fruit. We'd gone from a million two to about four to 500,000, and then the second freeze to 86,000. Well, you can't run a packing house on that kind of fruit. And we were buying some fruit from other growers and putting through our packing house. And we held on, but when 89 came, there wasn't enough fruit left. And so basically, um, the celery was discontinued, the fertilizer plant was sold, the citrus packing house was uh, discontinued, and we then had to send our fruit to other people to process. And so at that point, there was no financial incentive for people to, that owned uh, agricultural property, citrus especially, to replant and the value of the uh, property, like the Parkers in Goldenrod and everything toward the edge of Winter Park, <clears throat> all of those groves were sold in housing development. And then the housing development really, really started and um, has continued to this day. And so agriculture not really doesn't play much of a part in our economy anymore, unfortunately. But um, the freezes of the 80s, it probably was inevitable anyway, but the freezes of the 80s are what uh, sped it up. Could you tell me a little bit more about how your Evans family got involved in Nelson and Company? Well, as I said, my dad, uh, when he came back from the Second World War, he well, let me back up a little bit. Uh, my grandfather Wheeler, my mother's uh, father, um, was, we're not quite sure, but we think he, he was, if he wasn't born in Oviedo, then he went to uh, Dade City. Uh, his father was a Confederate veteran, and his mother, they had come down here, the Lawtons, after the war and from Georgia, and he came down <clears throat> to start over. And uh, he had a homestead here in Oviedo. George Thomas Wheeler was his name. But they went over to Dade City and he attempted to farm over there. And he had been injured in the war and he was in Richmond at the end of the Civil War. And he had been injured and he was working in a hospital up there. And he'd been involved in a lot of the major battles of the Civil War. We don't really know, but you wonder if that injury had something to do. So he died. My grandfather was um, uh, quite young, I think maybe uh, 10, 11, something like that. And the Lawtons sent a, a wagon, covered wagon, over there to get her and the two boys. And he came back to Oviedo and then started work to provide a living, there were no social programs in those days, to provide a living for his mother and younger brother. And he had an uncle who um, was very kind to him and taught him a Morse code. And he was very bright, even though uh, he didn't have a formal education, he was very bright. And so he became the station agent here in Oviedo, and he um, rose in the ranks and became president of the ORT, which is the Order of Railroad Telegraphers in the whole country. So my grandmother and my mom and her brother and sister, they traveled all over the country. They had free the railroad passes, and so they traveled all over the country to these meetings. And in the freeze of 1895, everything was sent out by um, uh, telegraph, and he realized how um, expensive, when those freezes happened, what fruit bought, brought, <clears throat> because he was sending and receiving 
the uh, borders, and he saw uh, where the fruit trees were not killed, and specifically some of those were out at Lake Pickett in East Orange County, out near UCF, uh, really, today. And so he made his mind up that he was going to be, to buy those groves. And so he uh, bought his first grove, his uncle sold him the first grove at the Wheeler Emmons house up here, I think in about 1901. It was a tangerine grove, it was 10 acres. And I think he had a 15 year mortgage on it but he did so well on it, he paid the grove off in three years. The tangerines did so well. And that got him started. And then he worked, um, he bought into, there were two Nelson brothers that had Nelson and Company that was started in 1886, the packing house downtown. And he bought in uh, with the two brothers and neither of the brothers, I don't believe, had any children. And so shortly thereafter, he just completely bought them out. And he incorporated the company in 1923. But he didn't change the name because all the brands had been set up in the northern markets. And in those days, your brand uh, was very, very important. Uh, more important than it is today and because um, the citrus labels when the boxes were in uh, stacked up to be sold uh, if you had a good brand your fruit would bring more money and so uh, it had a very prominent and historic brand and so he kept the name Nelson and Company well there haven't been any Nelsons now in a hundred years but you know, we still call it Nelson County, but when he started the fertilizer plant, he named it uh, Wheeler Fertilizer after him. And um, then when my dad came after the Second World War to work at Nelson and Company, he um, started uh, in 1954, he started a company called Evans Groves that my brothers and I still own today. And, um, but we have evolved, we still have some growth property, but we have evolved more into uh, commercial real estate. And we were the ones that had the property where the new downtown is being, all that property was our property. And some of it is still our property where the Sun Trust is, Panera, those out parcels along there, my brothers and I own. And this interesting thing about that, that uh, part of that initial property was a wedding gift to my mother and my dad. My grandfather uh, we was, had, was very um, insightful and couldn't see into the future. And he told them at the time it wasn't the best grove. Um, her brother and sister got better grows, but he told them that someday that would be a very valuable piece of property for real estate, which it is. And um, we, the brothers and my mom and I were responsible for uh, Reform Seminary is own part of the property down there. And they, uh, we gave them half the property and they bought half the property. When we first went down there, the road, Mitchell Hammock Road, didn't even go through. There was a little trail that went back in there. And when we were growing up, we lived on the end there, 340 South Central. And just beyond our house, the pavement ended. And then it was a two-lane uh, little dirt, two-rut dirt road all the way down to Iron Bridge and UCF wasn't even paved in there and um, so we had a great my dad would bring home uh, tractors and that sort of thing for us and we had about 600 acres behind our house and then in the afternoon after school we'd take those tractors and you know we had horses and um, well, he was really good to us um, because he had he brought all this stuff home and then we just had that 600 acres to play on growing up and um, my dad was uh, also 
He had a vision for the future too, and especially coming from the North, and he realized the winners up North and what they did and how after the Second World War, the migration, especially of uh, servicemen who had been stationed in the South, and especially Florida during the Second World War, came to love Florida. And then after the war, uh, many, many, many of them wanted to come back to Florida. So that coupled with air conditioning, just set us in motion down here. And my grandparents, um, in the summertime, almost everybody here would leave and go to North Carolina, or they had camp houses. We have a camp house out at Lake Pickett, and if it was too hot at night, they would just um, pack up and go out to the camp houses, and a lot of them were built, ours were built out over the water on stilts, and it would be, um, you'd always have a nice breeze out there and usually it'd be 10, 10 to 12 degrees cooler out there than it was in, in here. I mean, it happened, we weren't alone in that. People all, people all over Central Florida did that. But usually in August, they would leave the state and go to North Carolina. Um, so, you know, it was an ideally time to live you know, America was on the top after the Second World War. There really weren't that many problems, you know, culturally or whatever. In, and it was just a very peaceful and, um, you know, great time to grow up. The economy of Oviedo has been in transition for the last 30 to 40 years. Uh, can you describe the changes? Well, I've touched on some of it, uh, but as Ag went out, uh, we really don't have a, um, there hasn't been, in my estimation, a concerted effort to lure um, other industries to the community, but they have come. There's some interesting things that are happening here, but it's mostly entrepreneurial. There are no um, uh, major corporations that have moved in, like have moved in out at the research park and that sort of thing. So most that has come here have been uh, mom and pop type startups. Well, some very successful, the bank has, uh, my grandfather started the bank here uh, after the Second World War and uh, the bank has helped these corporations, these mom and pops with loans to get them homegrown so to speak. Um, and so we have some very interesting and creative things that are happening here now. But it's not to the scale or the extent of the research part, that sort of thing. The, the, I'm sorry, were you going to say Well, I was going to talk about educational system, but maybe you're going to get to it. Oh, go for it. Go for it. It's not well, I think one of the reasons that uh, Seminole County has done so well is that when I was growing up, we uh, were a rural county and a poor county that we didn't have the resources that Orange County had, so everyone assumed that Orange County would be the uh, major player. But in the 60s, the early 60s, uh, my dad was elected to the school board and Oviedo always got the handoffs because we didn't have the political muscle. And Sanford, you know, there were only three high schools, Oviedo, Sanford, and Lyman and um, in those days and so they decided that we needed a new high school, that Seminole needed a new one, needed to be three new high schools in the county and we didn't really have the resources. We were only getting about 85 cents on a dollar in Seminole County for uh, every dollar Orange County was getting. 
So I think they decided, the school board decided that they would do a bond issue. And it's, I can't quite remember, but I'm thinking it was in the 15 to 18 million dollars. Doesn't sound like a lot of money today. You probably couldn't build one school for that today. But in in the 60s, early early 60s, that was a lot of money, and a lot of people said that it would never pass in Seminole County because of all the agricultural people would not vote the additional taxes upon themselves. But my dad and the other people on the board got together and worked very, very hard. And surprise, surprise, it did pass. And that was the beginning of Seminole County moving forward and overtaking Orange County educationally. And he knew that he had met with an architect and he had decided, the architect had told him that if he could get about three million dollars out of the bond money, he could build the new high school here. And he knew if he waited until Lyman and Seminole that Oviedo wouldn't get anything. So he decided that he, he said at the meeting, if you'll give me three million dollars for Oviedo High School, the new Oviedo High School, because all 12 grades are still at <clears throat> Oviedo School, and we were about 600 students in the all 12 grades here, um, then you can split the rest however you want between Sanford and Lima, Seminole and Lima. And so that's what happened. And we got our school here but that was the beginning of Seminole County. You know, things don't happen overnight. We had some very, very bright and capable. Uh, Mr. Teague was in charge of the money. There's a school name for him. Uh, he was from South Carolina. His a wife taught here in Oviedo. Mr. DeShazzo. There were a number of these people that lived in Oviedo and drove to Sanford every day to work on the school system. The house we're in, T.W. Lawton, started the system way back when Seminole County broke off in 1913. He was asked to be school superintendent, so he was our school superintendent until in the 50s, and he set it on the right track, but when we got that money, then Seminole County uh, started progressing and their schools started progressing. And then when you have good schools, the uh, population and parents will follow the school system. So now uh, most of our schools in the county, we have some of the highest ranked schools in the state, I believe. And my wife's in real estate. Uh, residential real estate and so when people are moving down here they check especially in Oviedo and this area they realize what good schools we have and so they don't want to live in Orange County they want to live in Seminole County and so the fact that these uh, professional people are moving in to Seminole County has helped tremendously. Now the jobs they're going to may be in Orange County, but they're living in Seminole County. And we have one of the highest, because of that, we have one of the highest per capita incomes in the state. But a lot of that, I think, goes back to the fact of that first bond issue and all that hard work that was done many, many years ago to set the foundation for the schools and the educational system that we have today. Now, we were a small community, but we were a very, very highly educated community. And most of the kids at Oviedo, even when I graduated in 65, went off to college. And uh, as I say, my mother, did extensive uh, educational work. My grandmother had gone to college to a girls' school in North Carolina. Um, North Carolina. 
So people were very keen on education, even especially, I guess, uh, since they were in agriculture, but there was a high degree of formal education among the people in Oviedo. Um, and I think the educational, so we were delighted when UCF, although it didn't come to Seminole County, it came to Orange County, we were delighted that it was so close to Oviedo, and really we felt like it was a school for Oviedo. And then my dad also was on the board of Seminole Community College when it started. And it was a great resource for the county too. And now they have Seminole Community College has a wonderful campus here in Oviedo. And then we have RTS Seminary. So in a way, Oviedo has three colleges right here. If they're not in the city limits, very, very close to us. And we've been <clears throat> at great contact. My brothers and I, my dad, for instance, <clears throat> let the UCF crew team row out at Lake Pickett for 30-something years for free in one of our groves. And then a few years ago, they decided that they needed to buy a property and build. So they bought a 10-acre grove from us on Lake Pickett and established the uh, crew team out there. And so Oviedo has been, and people in Oviedo have been proponents of higher education for a long, long time. My grandfather, and a lot of this history is my, um, uh, my brothers and I, my mom, my uncle, did uh, the histories of our company, Nelson Company, uh, our properties downtown, to put all of them went on the National Register. We did the celery pre-cooler. We did the Wheeler Evans house. All of those histories can be looked up on the National Register. For instance, back in the day, my grandparents uh, sent, there were no um, scholarship type things, and they sent, was well, estimated about 26 kids to college from Oviedo. That would be in the 30s and the 40s, you know, before uh, scholarships came in. And uh, my parents followed in the same category, you know, the same line as did my brothers and I, thinking about uh, UCF coming in out here. Now those histories I don't need to go into because you can look them up on the National Right, all those properties. And my brothers and I and my mom did the history of the Methodist Church here in Oviedo too, which is a Gamma Rogers, you know, famous architect from Winter Park. And he did the church here. My grandmother got him to come and do the church be the architect of the church here. So, a little rambling along, but you know. <laughs> That's okay. That's fine. Okay, uh, the last question is, um, the buildings downtown have been there since the 1920s. How do you feel about the changes that will occur when the downtown buildings are going to be demolished? Well, I would hope, I had hoped initially that <clears throat> the uh, buildings could be preserved and there was a group uh, a number of years ago that tried to work on a beltway system for Oviedo because we felt like if we could get the traffic routed around the exterior of the town instead of through the interior that we had a chance of saving uh, the historic downtown but that didn't really happen because of Florida Avenue uh, in Black Hammock was um, uh, the people that lived down there had it designated some sort of uh, rural route. And so once they did that, then it wasn't, we weren't able to take a, a major four lane road down there. And the traffic, uh, there are five roads that come to the stoplight and for a community of 1900 people you know that had on street parking and all it was fine but when you have a community of 40,000 people just in the city limits the um, uh, traffic has overwhelmed the road system now it was all supposed to be done <clears throat> at one time uh, North Central and Broadway 
but when the uh, downturn came in uh, 2007, 2008, the funding dried up and so they split the project into two or three phases. I'm, wor I'm currently working on the first phase, which is uh, North Central, and acquisition is being uh, uh, done now for the property. And the, um, the stoplight, that intersection, is to be improved, I think, from what I understand, it will start sometime in early 2016. And now they're working on the second phase, which is Broadway. And really, we uh, didn't fight it because it had to be done. So the thinking was that <clears throat> since the Baptist Church was so close to the road on the north side, and that was one of the more historic um, uh, buildings, that they would take everything off the south side of the road. So we haven't done anything to our property in about 10 years. It looks awful, but you know, there's no reason to spend any money on it. And, uh, but everything is gonna be taken off the south side of the road. And I hope, I've been working on with Harlan Hansen, a land planner who helped downtown Orlando and downtown Winter Park. We've set up a CRA and we are uh, the same people that are working on the new downtown. Now uh, we're working to do the historic downtown. That's something that when the roads go in, it won't be what it was, but hopefully it'll be something that'll be creative and that people will appreciate and will give us a sense of uh, community of who we are and I think if you have a sense of where you've come from you know where you're going and so I'm gonna work really really hard on getting something nice and creative that will reemerge but we've had to be very very patient because we can't really do much of anything until the roads are put in but once the roads go in then I think the other the development will come <clears throat> after the roads. Is there anything else you'd like to add before our interview concludes? Well, let me think here. I had made a few notes. Um, oh, these are just random things, That's but okay. I think it's kind of interesting. In the <clears throat> 40s, when I was a little boy, <clears throat> We still had a civil defense tower downtown that was manned uh, during the day and people would sit down there and any airplane that came over, they had binoculars and they would, uh, I guess they knew what kind of plane and they would take the markings of the plane and then call, I guess, a central office somewhere and tell them where the plane was because in those days, <coughs> When an airplane came over town, everybody went outside to take a look because it was such a rare occurrence. And we had the Naval Air Station, you know, in Sanford that was built during the Second World War. And we had McCoy down here. And we had Strategic Air Command, the big bombers were down here. So the ones the wings that spread would come over and people would go outside. It was a rare occurrence to go out and look at. It was kind of interesting to think about it today. I mean, we just take, well, sometimes my wife and I will say, well, that's Virgin Atlantic coming in from London because we've taken that flight in the past and we know that plane comes in late in the afternoon and you can spot it. <laughs> but in those days, it was any plane that came in. It was very unusual. and. Um, Along that line is, this was before air conditioning too. When we were the first, my grandparents were the first people to have air conditioning. He had, my grandfather hated the heat. And so he had it in the office, the water chill, and then he took it up to the historic Wheeler Evans home just down here. And um, once air conditioning came and the windows shut up, then you didn't hear the noises as much. But I can remember the night of the Cuban uh, uh, Bay of Pigs, 
that all night long we tossed and turned because you could hear the planes coming everything we were militarizing everything to South Florida and so all night long you didn't know we didn't know it was happening because it was all secretive but the next morning my dad said that they had called and they had confiscated a lot of our rolling stock of our citrus and uh, rolling stock to take the supplies because we thought there was going to be an invasion of Cuba and we thought we were going to be involved in it and so all the government confiscated so all that noise we heard the night before was the US military moving equipment and supplies into South Florida and we know it didn't happen unfortunately probably if we had gone ahead and invaded we wouldn't have had to put up with Castro and all that mess down there for all these years but it didn't happen politically for whatever reason and um, I, I just thought that was something that was kind of interesting and then um, let's see uh, I thought another thing is um, my um, my dad had um, when he you know more people died in the flu than died in the first world war and my dad was from a small town in Pennsylvania and he was five years old and uh, grandmother Evans had uh, she had he had a younger sister and she was pregnant with the youngest child and my grandfather's brother George Evans uh, caught the flu and grandmother uh, my, my grandfather, his name was Arthur Evans, he wanted to go see his brother and grandmother begged him not to go see his brother. But he went to see his brother and the two brothers, he caught the flu and the two brothers died within a week of each other. And so like my mom's uh, father, he was widowed uh, she was widowed and pregnant but he had joined my grandfather Evans had joined an organization called the Moose it's a fraternal organization and if you belong to the Moose she was a teacher and if you belong to the Moose you could go to a quote unquote orphanage called Moose Art out from Chicago and you know you could be it was like a private boarding school but it was a you know for children whose parents had died orphanage so she took the three of them and went over there and she was a house mother and my dad was raised in that uh, orphanage well when he um, they would play sports teams around that area and he, they would play uh, Culver Military Academy in Indiana. So when I was a little boy, well, 11 years old, um, they decided that I should go to camp at Culver Military Academy. It's a quite a famous school, a boarding school. And um, so it's hard to believe today that these things would happen, but uh, my grandfather, having his association with the railroad, she took me to Sanford, my mom and dad took me to Sanford, put me on the train, and she gave the porter, uh, I thought, five or ten dollars, of course that was in uh, 1950 or so, let's see, 47, that'd be 53, 54, somewhere there, so probably five dollars or ten dollars was a a lot of money in those days and she just told the porter she said this is uh, uh, Mr. Frank's grandson so I want you to make sure that he gets to Indiana it was a two-day trip and I was on there by myself 11 years old 
Well, every time it was sweet, every time the porter got off, because the same porter didn't go the whole way, every time he'd get off, I could hear him say in the back, now that's Mr. Frank's grandson, you watch over him until the next porter took over, you know, so it was passed down. And I had a cousin, they picked me up in the middle of Indiana somewhere and um, then took me to the school because Culver was remote, you know, it's out in the country. And, um, but I had a great time up there. I learned a lot and came home. But I thought to myself, today, there's no way parents would put an 11-year-old boy on a two-day trip on a train by himself. But I, when we were thinking about this, I thought that it, it, there's a stark contrast between the way life was and what people expected to be okay and normal then and what some of the crazy things that happen today. And my mom said it would be the same thing when she would leave Sanford to go to Northwestern. It would be in September and it would be really, really hot here, no air conditioning. But she said, and so she'd have to, uh, when her luggage, her trunks and all came through, she'd have to dig down in there and get her uh, winter coat. And but it took her two, two days too, just like it took me. Now you can't go now from Sanford, you just went to Sanford, Jacksonville, and then to Chicago. Now Amtrak, you have to go up the East Coast and then across, but in those days you could go from Jacksonville across, you didn't have to go up the East Coast on the railroad, you could go across. And it was really, really nice in those days. Now they didn't get me, um, usually when we traveled we would get uh, a sleeper, but they thought like I would be uh, better served just to be in a uh, coach, you know. And I met the nicest people all the way along, all the way up when people would come, you know, they would see me and I would talk to them, these ladies and these men, you know, and just talk to them. So I, I just enjoyed myself thoroughly and I wasn't a bit apprehensive or afraid. I was really looking forward to it. And, um, so it was just like my mom said in those days, um, things were, they were simpler and there wasn't, I don't know, people were just expected to do the right thing and they did the right thing. So I was trying to think if there was anything else as far as the, um, um, I can't think of anything. Did you have any further questions that, Okay. Well, I appreciate you doing this interview with Thanks. me. Thank you for your time. Thank it's been you. great meeting you. Nice to meet you.